We're back. Right? We're a little starting to fall a little bit behind schedule. So I want to go right to a video. Right? We're going to start off. We got more videos to show you guys. First video today. Let's do it. Let's get to that video. Let's get going on these tips. Right? Play the video, sir. Let's go. Maybe not. I'll just stay. And that was just a joke. Okay. <laughs> Hello there, how's it going? Shane Olson here. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm so happy that we're able to do the ZBrush Summit again. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. I wanted to show you this really cool tip that I figured out about how to make eyeballs using live Boolean. It, it's really cool because it makes it so your eyes can be editable. So it's non-destructive. It's a non-destructive workflow. It's really cool. I'm excited to show you. So let's get to it. I wanted to start out with the base anime head that ships with ZBrush. You can find it by pushing comma and going into Lightbox and just going to your projects and it's this head right here. Okay, I just loaded that head up and when you first load it, it's going to look something like this. Okay, and basically I just took a little bit of time and sculpted in some eyes like this and I added some eyelashes and eyeballs so it looks like this, so we have a place to start. Okay, now the next thing we do is we want to turn on live Boolean and we're going to be using spheres to cut the iris and a cylinder to cut out the pupil and a disc to cut out another little ring around the iris. Really cool technique and uh, let's get to it. So basically what I've done is I filled this sphere with white and we're using the skin shade material and then I just made these, these eyelashes. What I want to do now is I want to cut some spheres out of these eyeballs. And how I do that is I'm going to select these eyeballs and then I'm going to go to this insert multi mesh brush. Now this is my insert multi mesh brush, but you can use the one that comes with ZBrush, which is right here. You can use any of these um, spheres. It doesn't matter. The object doesn't matter what you're cutting out of what. That really doesn't matter. It just needs to be a sphere of some sort with the iris. So you can build it so it's kind of like a realistic eye even though this is stylized. Okay, so we're going to come from the front here and click and drag and hold down shift. Now you'll notice that when you insert a sphere, it's going to be whatever color that you insert. Okay, so since I was using the skin color to fill this head with, it's going to uh, color this skin shaded. And we don't want our irises skin shaded, that'd be weird, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna color this, any color that we want to have our eye, which is really cool. Um, you can click on the skin shade and change it to like say a, a bright blue, maybe even brighter than that, let's be obnoxious here. And we'll fill it with this blue color. And I want to go down to a paintbrush, any kind of paintbrush. We just want to fill it with RGB color and we'll hit fill object and that will fill our spheres with this blue. Now nothing's going to happen yet until we make these spheres a separate subtool because we're going to cut a subtool out of a subtool. Okay. Um, right now these are both part of the same subtool, but whenever you draw an insert multi mesh, it will automatically mask out the object that you drew it on. So that's great because it allows us to split those two pieces into two separate subtools. And how you do that, so it's under subtool and then under split, and you can click on this split unmask points. If you click on that, now each of these objects are in different subtools as you can see here. And we have our eyeballs and we have our eye, what's going to be our irises, okay? Now I'm gonna click on the irises and we're going to grab this gizmo. And another thing that's nice is when you insert a mesh, it will automatically put that gizmo at the point that you clicked on the surface of the object to insert it, if that makes sense. You can see it right here, okay? So what, what I want to do, and you can change whichever side of the gizmo you want it on by hovering over that little orange dot. It will move the gizmo, okay? So I want to grab this, uh, this rectangle and scale it down on Z and then we're going to push it into the eyeball a bit. Okay. And now we want to subtract this away from the eyeball. So we're going to change this to subtract. So if you click on this little button right here, that means subtract. And now you can see how 
this is being subtracted from the eyeball, which is super cool. And it's also, since it's a sphere, it's giving us some nice shadow inside the iris and a nice highlight down on the bottom down here. Okay. But it's, we can take it a little bit further. Um, what I mean by it's dynamically adjustable, that just means I can grab this sphere now and I can move it around and it will, uh, it will adjust. Now you can see that it's actually subtracting itself out of the, the skin. And if you don't want it to do that, what you can do is go up to these eyeballs right here and click on, there's this little start arrow. If you can see the start arrow right here, I just clicked on that. And that just says, start here. Okay, you can actually see the word pop up and say start. That just means it's not going to subtract this sphere out of the head. Okay, and I obviously didn't make my, um, my eyeball socket deep enough. So, whoops, let me grab the right one. Um, so I need to pull that forward just a little bit. And I can move it around. And I can make my eye cavity deeper. Or I can make it so it's, you know, it, it doesn't matter if it cuts it away or not. And now if I want, I can do the same thing with the pupil. So with the pupil, I want it to be a cylinder rather than a sphere. So I'll go down here and I'll grab my cylinder here. And since I already know that whatever color I draw it as, it's going to be that color. So I'm going to go ahead and bring this down, not, not to 100% black, just about here. And then I can click and draw on this surface. I can turn live Boolean off for a second if I want to. Then I can actually see what I'm doing because I'm going to draw it on the center of this sphere. It's going to look really weird. Okay. About that big. And again, I want to split it off. Okay. So I'm going to go down to uh, Subtool menu, Split Unmask Points. Okay. And that's going to split it off right here. And I can turn Live Boolean back on. And now you won't see it. So if you hit Shift F to show your wireframes, you can actually see your object in a semi-transparent mode, which is nice. I'm going to show my gizmo. And if I push this cylinder down into the eye, it will start to cut it out. Okay. I have perspective on. There we go. Let me turn perspective off and kind of center this better. Now, if I hit Shift F to turn that back off, you can see how it's starting to cut this out. Okay, but again, I don't have my, um, my eye sockets deep enough. So let's go ahead and grab this head and I'm gonna pull the eye sockets into the head more so we don't have that occlusion and that weirdness. So I'm just gonna go move the eye socket into the head a little bit more and fix that, okay? So there we go, and now we don't have that issue any longer. And now we can go ahead and take our um, irises and make them larger. If you want to, you can um, center this gizmo by clicking on this little icon right here. It will center the gizmo in the middle of this iris. Now what we can do is we can also hide the head and the lashes so we can see exactly what's happening. And this isn't a very good, it's not working very well. So let's turn this so it's actually sitting on the surface of the eye and then kind of move it over here and center it in there better. Okay, and then over here we can do the same thing. We can kind of turn it a little bit and get it looking better. Okay, turn off our, now we have our eyes looking much better. Now the last thing I can do, say I want a gradient inside of this iris. Well, if you've ever made eyes before, you might have realized, you might have thought, man, how am I going to put a gradient in there? Um, you know, it, you'd have to have enough points in order to do your poly paint inside there. And it's easy to just turn off live Boolean for a second and then grab a color. So I'm going to grab a, I have this soft paintbrush down here, grab this color and maybe make it lighter, maybe, maybe like a lighter uh, tealish color. Okay. And then I can come down here and just kind of paint the fade, the gradient in like this. Okay. And now if I turn live Boolean back on, you'll see that it actually takes on the color of whatever you're subtracting out of that eyeball. I can do it again with the shadow. 
So let's turn live boolean back off so I can see the shape. I'll select this color and I'll, this time I'll go darker with it. And I, I want to color in some, uh, some dark shadow across the top here. And then if I turn live boolean back on, you can see that shadow right there. And you can kind of paint it while it's hidden too. And it'll work like that. So you can do a nice gradient while it's being cut out. And that's what I'm talking about being non-destructive. Now, what if I wanted a very, very small outline around this iris? Okay, I'm going to duplicate the, the uh, pupil. So duplicate the pupil. And then I want to sub subtract that as well. But I want to uh, reset the... Well, I, I have the gizmo right where I need it to be, actually. So it's here. I want to move it out in space and then scale it up locally. So turn on local symmetry. Scale it up. This will be tricky, but I want to align it the same direction as this sphere here. Okay. And if I turn on live boolean, you'll kind of start to see what I'm talking about. So if I scale this up, I want it to be just slightly larger than the, uh, the sphere, the squish sphere that's cutting out the iris. Okay. And then if I push that right against the eye like that, it's going to start to create this ring. See that ring? So now I, it's a little off center, so I just need to move it and just kind of make it so it's uh, cutting that out like that. I can shrink it and move it. So now we have our pupils and our the rings and we can color this ring whatever we want so if i didn't want it to be like stark black like that i can grab this color uh, grab this hard paintbrush and just fill the object and now it's like a darker blue instead of a, a black okay and now we can un then we can show our head and we can show our lashes and now we have eyeballs that we've created with live boolean that we can now uh, edit. It's, it's non-destructible. So I can go and change the size of those eyes however I want. Or I can say I can get rid of those, um, the outline. Okay. And I can just scale them up and down, or scale the pupils up and down like this. And grab these irises and I can move them up and down in scale like that. It's, it's just, it's almost like it's rigged and animated. It's, it's super nice. Very, very nice to uh, adjust those eyes. So anyway, thank you very, very much for watching. Again, I hope you're enjoying the summit and we will see you on Mondays. I stream Mondays live every Monday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. So we'll see you then. Thanks for watching. Take care. Bye. See, these are the tips that I really love. Like, that was awesome. Like, it's just taking like things that are there and then using them in those creative ways. Like, you're taking the Boolean and adding the color from the Boolean and you're manipulating it to get your different things. It's crazy. You're totally muted. Cake, cake, <laughs> cake. It's like a cake, a layer cake, right? I love it. It's like layering things. That's amazing, Shane, right? And that's the thing that we've been trying to say during all these things too, right? Is thinking about the features, thinking a little bit outside the box and just think about the stuff we just showed you guys. Like <laughs> your minds must be blown. All right, I want to move on to the next video. Let's get to the next video. So we're going to play the next video for you. Mr. Thomas Wittelbach is going to be our next video. Hello, I'm Tomas Wittelsbach and I'm going to show you a technique I use to retain my obsessive detail into printing. And so, if you don't know me, I'm fairly well known for making stuff that has obsessive detail in jewelry. And before the last couple of releases, it was really a, a task to try to retain the really, really, really tiny detail that I wanted to keep in certain areas while still retaining a small model size so it can go out to print. Here is the model that I'm going to show you. This is a beetle head from a bracelet that I made. And as you'll notice, when I talk about detail, I'm talking about X, Y detail, not Z detail in the Z axis detail in the printer. You can have a printer that's like 
2 microns on the z-axis, but if it's xy, 100 microns, that's a pretty big thing, and you're not going to get surface detail. When I talk about surface detail, I'm talking about this stuff. It's all this minute, like this area right here. Like a lot of this would go away because it doesn't have the resolution to retain this. So that's why some of the printers are a lot better. Most of the good printers are 25 microns, and this will be retained in a 25 micron print. So let's just take this area for example. I decimated this down to 150,000 polys. And you can see that, you know, from back here, you'll, you'll, from back here, you'll get something, but it's not what I want. So the first thing I do is I decimate down to a very low number because we're going to be adding geometry back in where we want it. Next thing we do, we turn on Sculptures Pro and we turn on the history brush. Okay. It's very important, and this is otherwise you're going to be like, oh, how do I get to my history state? I just want to make it very clear. Bef we're at our 250,000 polys. We're going to come back to our main beetle head that's full resolution. I'm going to come in here and see our little orange square here. I'm going to hold down control, and I'm going to touch that square. See how that becomes a white block? So even if I move forward in our history, you can see, or in our, um, our undo history, you can see right there that there's the little white square. That white square marks your history state. No matter how many times you continue to work on this, that's always going to stay there until you can come back to it. Hold down control and tap it and turn it off. So you can see it's orange. Turn it on. White block. Turn it off. We want it on. Boop. We're going to come back to this guy. Come over here. Turn on Sculptress Pro. I sit there and scrub on that all day with the history brush, and it's not going to work. Turn on our history brush. And you can see that we start to sharpen this up. It's bringing back a little resolution. All right, let's turn this on, see it. Make our brush smaller. Oops. And it brings back more resolution. And then if we want it more, make it smaller. And you can see that it's going to assign those really nice, sharp, crispy detail. We can bring it right back and in. For those of you who are not familiar with um, Sculptress Pro, how I have mine set up is the size of the brush is the size of the is the size of the mesh that it's going to tessellate. So, as you can see, we're adding geometry back, and you can see how it sort of got smoother there, right? Now I believe this is the brush default, but let me show you where this is at just in case. If we come under our brush menu, come down to Sculptress Pro, see Enable and Use Global. I have this on this way. If we turn Use Global off, you can see Adaptive Size Combined. Now what that allows me to do, and then I'll hit Use Global. So with my settings as such, what this allows is that if, let's come back down to a lower resolution so it becomes very clear. When I come in, that adaptive makes the amount of tessellation that happens is based on the size of my brush, thus adaptive. It adapts to the size of my brush. Let's turn this on. Come in here. And you can see with Sculptress in History turned on, We're getting a little bit more detail. You can see we've added geometry. We're getting a little bit more detail by going over this this way. But you can see it's not really great. I'm going to lower my brush size again. And you can see that it sharpens all that up dramatically. And let's go back and look at it here. You can see that we've added geometry. Let's make it smaller. And yep. 
Boy, I'm just all over the place today, aren't I? And so you can see that it gets more and more detailed, and I'm going to make it just a little smaller here. So this stuff gets really crispy, sharp. And there you go. You can see that that's darker in there. I don't know how much more resolution we actually can get out of this. Well, it seems like quite a bit more. And you can see how those edges are actually crisping up pretty dramatically. This is really close in, so it looks pretty rough, but it's not. <laughs> we zoom out, you can see that that's pretty sharp there. So adaptive means that my brush size changes, or the tessellation amount changes with my brush size. And it's right there in Sculptures Pro. So those are my settings, and that allows me a lot of freedom in using Sculptures Pro with history. We shrink our brush down a little, and I come back in, and I add geometry where I need it. And here we're going to switch to this so you can actually see it happen. And I'm just going to... This is, let's say this is the top of the ring, so I really want this area to be visible. Or this area is very visible, so I want it to be highly detailed. Okay, that's not bad. But I still want some crispness here. So I'm just going to lower my brush a little more and come back in. And I'm going to just crisp up these little areas that are just a little soft. And that's just by me adding extra geometry and using the history brush to reapply to the 21 or the 20 million poly model. So you can see, and we've jumped up to 267,000 polys. So you can see you can find those areas that you really want, like, you know, that are the indirect eye view. And you can really tune those up just by using history and sculptress at the same time. On a decimated model helps. Let's see. Let's say we really want this stuff because this is, you're going to look at the eyes of things. We're trained to look at the eyes of things. So the things around the eyes need to look good. I'm going to bring this up a little more because this isn't super crisp detail. So you can see I'm just kind of sharpening up some of this stuff. And then as I sharpen it up, it's going to show me where I need finer detail. You know, if you have a 50 micron printer, you may not want to take it too far. But I do because I'm crazy that way. And you can see that we just come back in and what was muddy now crisps up. Make it smaller and you can make it crisp up even more. So all you're doing is you're going in and you're dialing in the detail where you want it. And so you can leave certain areas not done because you can't just redo the whole model or you wind up with a 20 million poly model. <laughs> so this is just a very easy way to come in and crisp up the detail before you send it out. And I try to have my target model size about a million polys. I think most, most printers can take a million poly model. And I find that it's just a good universal rule a million polys is okay. Um, so you can see how very quickly we can bring detail back to the focal point and still retain a model that's under a million polys. Obviously, if you try to do the whole thing, you're going to fail. Or you're going to fail at hitting that million poly model. You can get all the detail back. So that is, that's the technique. Decimate, get Sculptress Pro, your history brush on, make your original model, the history state here by holding control. You can see I turned it off and turned it back on. So now everything's going to reproject to this. And um, yeah, I think that's one of the best ways to retain high detail in the areas that are really going to be seen after decimation. All right, have a great summit. Yeah.
Yes, yes. And then now think about it, right? The version we just showed how much Thomas is going to be able to take that workflow to another level with all yep, yep. the Sculptor's Pro, much more detail he's going to be able to get now. If he wants to throw some of that contrasting in now, like guys, you got to think about this. That's not available to you yet, right? Okay. So I want to show something really quick. I want to add to this because I think what Thomas is showing is so important. I want you guys to think differently and change your workflows a little bit. I'm telling you right now, I'm sure all of you have done the point where you're working on like me, right? I'm working on this gremlin. Guys, I'm working on a gremlin. Now I got to start cutting it up for printing. I, I can't stress the, this history recall that Thomas was talking about, how beautiful this is, but there's other things to do this, right? I'm sure all of you have done this where you've got sub tools, right? And you got a version of the sculpted version, right? So in this case, I've got a sculpted version of the head here, right? It's all sculpted up. And then you guys are just per trying to project that in to this, right? So here's the thing, people. Right now, I've got a Ziri mesh version of my Gremlin. And you see, I, I probably grouped out the ears on purpose for me for cutting. But if you look, this particular sculpt already had information. It already had the sculpt in it, right? I no longer do the duplicate thing anymore. I don't, I've never do that anymore, ever. Because I want to take advantage of what Thomas was just talking about. I guys, please pay attention to this. I don't do the duplicating sub tools anymore. It makes my workflow so much cleaner. It makes opens up so more benefits. So just like Thomas, right? I've got now this head. I'm gonna just divide it up a couple times, right? Just we'll go here. We'll even go to a million. So now obviously there's no skull because when you remesh it, you lose your skull. So just like Thomas, I'm gonna just go backwards in my do on history here until my sculpt comes back. There's my sculpt, right? But I still have all this undo history in front of me. So I'm gonna hold down the control key and tap, just like, just like he did, right? And now that, if I cycle through, you can see there's a marker there. Can you guys see that? So you can see that now there's a marker right there and now I'm sitting here. The orange one is where I'm sitting. So I got 11, 11, and now it's sitting here. So what I mean by there is no need to duplicate your meshes anymore, because now, instead of doing the projection you guys have always done, forget that one. You just come down here and say project, and you say project history. You click that, and the only thing ZBrush is now going to project is where that gray point of interest is. So even when you guys are using things like Dynameshing and even Sculptures Pro, and you're destroying the topology, you can now, on the same mesh, retopologize it, divide it up, and then just tell, go grab the sculpt when I was using Dynamesh and when I was using Sculptures Pro and put it back on my model. It's like, it's a no brainer for me now. And guys, this is how I was doing the printing. When I first started this, I had no real major plans to print this guy out. And now I do, but it didn't destroy my work. I didn't just start doing all these duplicated sub tools. I'm just using this technique now to get that to where I need it to be, right? And then that that's it. That's all I have to do. And ZBrush is going, okay, I know where your, your point of interest is. I know where you want me to go and I'm going to project that back into itself, right? Now, remember too, with, with the approach Paul's talking about here, it's reliant on your undo history. So if you're saving ZTLs and you go to open them back up, you're not going to have that undo history. So you need to work this, this process needs to work with the ZPR files or the project files. Just one thing there with that. Yeah. And the key thing here is the topology is not going to matter anymore. There's, it doesn't, it's not going to matter. That's it. It's not going to matter. Right? So this to me, saves my life so many times it's so much easier it's a cleaner workflow and then we're off and running right there you go there's my sculpt boom boom there it is i've got all the sculpt back but i got it back on what the read apologize version and i didn't have to make another head everywhere and everything else like that all right i want to move it over to joseph trust now and i'm just i'm just going to play in the uh the summit the version we have. You're going to play in the uh, the, the special <laughs> version? Yeah, so speaking of uh, Thomas's crazy details, this this had a, <laughs> this is another model that I, I worked on for a while, for a long time ago for this uh, armature. And you can definitely, like, with ZBrush being a digital software, you can go in and get as detailed as crazy as you want to go. So oftentimes, if I build things, I want them to be, like, almost as precise as they are in the real world. So often, we'll get reference from real world objects. So, like, this random flange I found at Lowe's, like I replicated it 100% um, in terms of what it is inside ZBrush. So you can definitely get, you know, high, high fidelity details out of your stuff. And that's one thing that Thomas is uh, amazing at with all his jewelry. 
And then so once again, I'm gonna hit on, since I can show the summit version now, is the stuff that Thomas is gonna be able to do afterwards as well. So as he was going through and using that history recall brush to get those things, he had to have that entire model in view. The next version you all get, which is becoming this holiday season here, if I come through and now I can isolate part of the mesh here, and now I can still use Sculptors Pro on that isolated part. Now, another thing too with Sculptors Pro is remember that we're looking at your brush size, right? So if you have it and you're drawing it out, you know, you can see it's gonna smooth that out and add that tessellation in there, but you're gonna lose some of those details if you have this intensity on. So another thing that I like to do, is just you can bump this intensity all the way down for your smoothing brush. So if you hold shift and get that, and then come across the surface and smooth that out, it's not gonna change the topology as much as it would as if you didn't have that smoothing on. And once again, their size of that brush, depending on what your settings are in your Sculptors Pro modifier here, is gonna determine how much of that topology is gonna be added. But you can see if I do a really small one, I'm gonna go through and still be able to capture those crazy details I was getting on this model from that contrast brush that Paul was showing. So this was done with that, so I got those contrast details out of there. And then now going back in with Sculptors Pro, that really tiny brush, I have my smooth brush set with zero intensity. And so what this is gonna do, is just adding that topology there. So another little thing there, this isn't using the history recall brush, but if you just need to add topology to an area, you can do this with smooth really easily. And it'll come through and add it there. And it's still gonna try to keep those details on the surface there. Don't so another little trick there. Tessimate. Don't forget about Tessimate people, Tessimate. Yeah, and you, you also have Tessimate, Tessimate too. Mask off, mask off and Tessimate. Yep. So if I want this, let's go, let's undo here. Let's go back to my the model before I was managing those arms there and we'll mask. Let's invert that quick. And now there also is Tessimate too, as Paul brings up. And this will go through and look at the polygons in that area. And if you change the slider here up or down, you're going to be able to add localized geometry to that part too. So as I keep going down here, it's gonna add localized geometry. So you can use this as well with just masking and then add more geometry just to specific areas of your mesh. So another good thing there, just mask out a part and then use the Tessimate process here to just add resolution in those areas. And wherever you have masking or unmasked areas, when you apply that Tessimate, it's gonna go through and add that geometry in there. So you can see that's what I had before and after. And if I come back to my mesh, Nice. So nice. there you go. That's all I got. All right. There's so much Excellent stuff. stuff. Can, I can literally talk Excellent about. Stuff. I can literally talk about the history recall and all those workflows and extractors for literally an hour, easily. Mm -hmm. But we yeah. got videos we got to get through. Yes. So I want to say thank you also to Form Labs who's sponsoring this segment right now. They're uh, helping us again. One of our proud sponsors helping us with uh, everything you guys are seeing here in the summit too, and proud to have them be part of this. But like Joseph said, let's move on to the next video. Hello guys, my name is Daniel Angelozzi, also known as Danko, and I've been using ZBrush for 14 years. And well, for me, 3D was a game changer for my creativity and profession. Today, I would like to show you a nice technique that I use often in my workflow that takes advantage of the way that the layer brushes interact with the morph target feature. I use this approach anytime I have to create stuff like scales or airs, spikes, all the details in which I don't want to have the effect of the alphas stamped one close to the other to create the sense of overlaps. Because, you know, one of the... <coughs> Most common techniques uh, to create details is uh, just take brush, uh, associate to it uh, one alpha that you can have created or uh, purchased, uh, select the uh, right type of stroke and the right intensity and start creating stamps of these alphas. So let me raise up the intensity, okay, like this. And there is a problem, um, no matter how hard you try with the setting maybe a radial fade to make the borders uh, being more blurred and with the focus shift, you will always end up with some artifact. Uh, you will always have this sort of patchy look in which you can really spot even from the far that there are zones in which the intensity is higher and the intensity is lower because this corresponds to the center of the brush and this is 
the outer part uh, and the other thing is that no matter how hard you play uh, you play with the placement and again the focus shift and the radial fade uh, whenever you have alphas that come one on top of the other here you will always have the sense of uh, overlapping take take taking place so detail on top of another detail so the scale here is not so clean so there is a nice workaround that uh, even though will always uh, require you to put a minimum of effort uh, to create nice detailing and to create some clean up because we always want to put some sort of creative thinking in our detailing will make the need of uh, this uh, clean up stage less extreme and I came out with this idea once that they had to create details for a tile skin so let's start with some quick theory just to understand the logic of this technique uh, in order to do this I want to start with a simple plane and make this a poly mesh because sometimes thinking in terms of flat surfaces uh, helps uh, uh, getting the logic better so I will subdivide let's say to 1 million polygon so every type of brush in ZBrush has this logic so I will raise for a second I up the intensity and lower down the focus shift on my standard brush just to have a, a stronger stroke uh, whenever I'm going well maybe this is a way too low as focus shift so let's make this less extreme whenever I'm going on top of a surface in ZBrush basically I'm using a particular algorithm that is the brush uh, type base type to deform the surface so I'm pushing the points uh, inside or outside based on the ZAD or ZSAB and the particular algorithm the logic is that whenever I go on top of something that has already details which the surface is modified it will keep adding detail on top of the details the addition will be based on what lies underneath and this is the, the, the logic behind the fact that if I have some alpha of a scale and I have another scale those two scales will somewhat um, overlap together there is a particular uh, brush inside of ZBrush or a base type brush type that is the single layer I will select this layer brush that works in kind of slightly different way so I will uh, make a intensity and again put a low focus shift to have a super crisp detail by default um, this layer brush uh, will act uh, as any other type of brush uh, so let's say that the plane is uh, a, a depth value of zero so uh, whenever I go with this brush let's say that I'm adding something and uh, let's assume that this is one if I put another one another stem that will add one whenever I go on top of zero it will become one but if I go on top of something that has already one this part will become two because you can see that it's kind of double the, the detail and so if I keep adding here I will have two and here I will have three and on and on and on but I can with this brush store a morph target basically storing a morph target will store the actual uh, version of the tool and keep it in memory and when I have a morph target stored the amazing fact and the cool fact of the single layer brush type is that uh, it will not add to the surface based on the actual um, actual tool but it will always look uh, at the morph target version to keep adding detail what I mean is that uh, now I have saved the stamp of my plane here just to uh, for you to remember that this is the morph target so if now I add one and I will create another one whenever I go here it will not keep into account take into account that here there is one but uh, we'll see that in the morph target it is zero the consequence is that uh, if I go over on this it will not add so one one and in the joining part will be one there is a, a cool consequence of this there are a lot of cool consequences but the, the, the main one is that uh, if I have something that add less than, than one it will look like it's going underneath but just because uh, here the detail is higher so it will not keep adding and here is higher so it will add but not carry with it the detail of the scale uh, another cool consequence because uh, if you start to connect the point uh, is that if I have an alpha that kind of creates some sort of gradient so let me get rid of the radial fade value 
okay you can see that in the parts in which the detail is higher they will go higher so let me okay in which the detail becomes lower it will become lower so with this I can really create uh, scales uh, that uh, are not uh, overlapping because uh, now I can go and select uh, this nice chameleon let's be sure that they have uh, a layer selected okay and, and i will find okay this is a, a scale alpha that i've created by myself uh, so basically if i have a store a morph target store i can okay let's store a morph target i can use this uh, to create scales that don't overlap and one day whenever i have to create uh, this sort of reptile skins uh, i use this approach i first of all uh, lay down uh, um, a repeated pattern as surface noise uh, so basically this uh, tool has uvs uh, and i take advantage of the uv to go under the noise uh, and associate the dialable alpha and um, that will be driven by the uvs so with this i can say okay and now instead of applying the noise uh, i really don't want to apply the noise because uh, by applying the noise i will have uh, some parts of the mesh being put inside pulled inside and some pushed outside and for this particular technique i always want my detail to go um, um, kind of for the most part uh, uh, outside so instead of applying I will just mask by noise uh, invert the mask and inflate on a positive value those scales okay like this not not too much because I really want to create uh, this sort of a realistic detail now if I select any type of uh, layer brush and this is of course a single layer brush I can uh, create scales and the logic is that if the intensity of the scale is higher it will uh, pop out from from this uh, this sort of layer uh, otherwise uh, if it's less uh, it will go under so, uh, i can really use any type of single layer brush and if i expand my brush menu i can see that i have those three kisel kisel 3d and kisel creature that in theory are uh, single layer brushes so i can take this and i can also create spikes and those spikes you can see that will come out yeah they, they clean up also the scales because there are parts that go inside in this uh, brush but you can see that i can really create those detail without having this sense of overlap there is a small issue and i want to mention because uh, um, at the, in the beginning it drove me kind of mad there is this kisel 3d that even if in theory is a single layer type uh, will have some issues because even if there is a more target you can see that the details will add on top of the other so uh, this is important to know even if you want to create your own vdm uh, because if you start from this uh, you will carry with you this issue so always start the creation of your vdm with the kisel or the kisel creature nor not this kisel 3d so, how to create a one on alpha real quick i will uh, now select a plane okay make a poly mesh and again i will subdivide let's say up to two um, hundred thousand polygons and in order to create our vdm the logic is that we want to have a perfect square plane so when i subdivided the, the borders were smoothed but in order to fix this i can go here under deformation and perform a morph, morph to grid up to 100. so with this set i will activate the symmetry and real quick i will start to sculpt uh, some scale detail uh, it will not look uh, so amazing because uh, we are um, short of time so i will just blur a bit i have a shortcut associated with the blur blur mask and i will mass in some shapes for this scale okay like so so let's move i can also play with the lower subdivision like this and i will deactivate the perspective and i want to be sure with the move infinite depth that i have some sort of tapering because uh, remember that i want the scale uh, from the root to the tip uh, to kind of become higher so it will allow me to create this sense of overlaps uh, i could also play with some sort of uh, slight undercut uh, just watch out that if you have extreme undercuts sometimes uh, um, 
you will want to activate the back face mask or the depth mask uh, because uh, even if with the moth target it could create other type of artifacts I'm not going really into this topic uh, for this video but just for you to know uh, let's say that we want to create this sort of snake or dragon uh, uh, scale type with those ridges on the border I kick once I've done this uh, if I want to be sure that this is uh, still a perfect square if I fear that I have touched the borders I can mask by feature invert the mask it will mask only the, the uh, outer borders because I don't have polygroups or whatsoever and only on this unmask part I can reperform a morph by grid now I can take my kissel creature and I have two options I can go here under the brush and create a multi alpha brush it will totally replace this collection and uh, take every sub tool of this uh, tool to create one element of the collection or if I want to add this to the pre-existing collection I can click this uh, from mesh now I can go back uh, here on my chameleon and you can see that with this scale I can really perform this sort of black magic and you can see that whenever um, with the drag, drag rectangle I'm creating <coughs> bigger scales so whenever the scale is lower it will be down uh, on the on the pattern so below the pattern but when it becomes bigger it will start to show out and I have created this with this sort of uh, from the tip to the root uh, being always lower because in this way I can make uh, this part uh, look like it's really coming out I really can use any type of alpha like this and I can use this technique for every type of stuff just to mention real quick also for air it can be useful because I can create uh, let's say the, the, the basic shape for the air and then with the just a layer brush set with let's say a kind of smooth alpha like this uh, dots I will lower down the lazy step just to be sure that it makes a nice continuous stroke um, like this now maybe I want something that is smoother um, usually I will create uh, my alpha set as I want uh, and for this I always like to use the layer not the kissel because the kissel is kind of too strong but uh, let's uh, let's pretend that this is the, the right one I can store a morph target and I can start to create hair and uh, when I with this hair I, you can see that when I go over on another hair it will not create the sense of this uh, sort of step and this is cool because I can also play with different intensity to create different layers of hair and also remember that let's say that we want to add another layer another um, layer of air on top so uh, I could also lower down for a second the total intensity by performing a slight morph so you can see I'm pushing the detail towards the original uh, original morph target and then now I can still add other fibers that I know that will go over on the pre-existing ones so I hope you enjoyed the video and this technique uh, happy Z brushing to everyone stay safe and ciao yeah so Danko is amazing amazing and if you haven't seen the uh, ZBrush masters with him it's incredible He's got a doctorate in uh, biotechnology. So it's Dr. Danko. If you ever see his Dr. name, it's because he's Danko. he is he does have a doctorate. It's crazy. That's really good. And, and yeah, look, he's gonna be able to like obviously with the new stuff, even expand that workflow more, right? With all the new features as well. So I want to show something really quick that you guys, I saw you guys going in in there. So I want to show something that I said I was gonna talk for those that watch the Hasbro Razor Crest. I told you I'll show you some techniques of how I like to do that paneling or what we call scribe lines in the hard surface world. So I wanna show you one of them right now that goes along with what Danko was doing there, right? I, I, I use this a lot, okay? So I've got my, my cargo ship here and I wanna start putting some scribe lining through here, okay? So I'm gonna go and do the same thing he did. I wanna store a morph target, okay? And now that I have a morph target, I wanna use this chisel brush right here. So this is the brush that's the brush right here. The first time you hit B, then C, that's the brush you're gonna get, okay? So what I like about this brush is you can grab any one of these here, these little things up here, right? Which is pretty much a VDM, same thing that he was doing, right? And you can see, you can start putting some scribe lines in there, right? 
So you can do whatever you want. Now, you can go crazy with this. You can do one like this and see it's got a double scribe lines. And then you got one that maybe is even doing something like that, right? There's variations here you guys are gonna be able to do. The point of the morph target is this. If I go, let's go with, I don't know, let's go with this one. If I go like that, right? And then now I come across, you see the depth is identical. There's no difference in the depth, okay, at all. That's what the morph target's gonna allow me to do with this brush. In essence, what he was doing was he's using that morph target to create a stable level to be able to brush across like this. Now, really quickly, the other thing I would add to this is since I want that thing to be the same size every time I pick up my brush and put down my brush, pick up my brush, down my brush, just like how my, my vocals go really loud and then really loud, like I blow your ears off. I'm never going to allow my hand to go in and out at the same time. So I'm actually gonna turn off pressure sensitivity. If you're in Joseph's world, he just starts using a mouse. I don't like using a mouse because then I gotta go find it. So, <laughs> This is all I do is like, this is me turning off for this particular brush. I'm turning off now. There, so no matter how hard I, this is really light. This is really hard. See, there's no difference. There's no difference in the stroke. Okay. And then what I want to add is now watch this. We'll just solo this out. So you guys can look at only the wing and in the stroke palette, this is using lazy mouse. Okay. And what I'm going to do to this is I'm going to drop the lazy radius. Like, I'm going to drop it way down. It's at 100. So that red line that you guys are seeing when I'm drawing, that's what that red line is. So you can see that it's not as big now. Okay? Because what I want to be able to do is do this. And then now just come straight across. And then go, boom. Like, look at that. Yes! And then now I can come across and just go straight across. And then there you go, right? And because I got a morph target, I'm getting the same depth right there. Right? You got to say depth like that. You got to be Sylvester. <laughs> it's got to be done. The last thing I want to talk about with this is this slider here. This, these are features that we put in only like, this is only like what, two versions ago? This is 2019, I want to say. You may need, I need the magnifier, Paul. Oh my goodness. You need a magnifier? Okay, dokey. There you go. Lazy snap. There we go. Lazy snap. All right. So I'm going to do this on something else just so it, because it's easier going to be easier for you guys to see. I'm just going to grab a sphere and do it on a sphere. It'll just you'll get a better understanding of where I'm going. And then we can put it on the model. So this is going to allow me that when you guys are sculpting like this, wee, right? And now you guys want to move the model around. And now what if I want to continue sculpting from here, right? Right. I want to be able to just keep going and going on this, right? So when I do this, right, I've gotten rid of my pressure sensitivity. If I store morph target now on top of this, so I'm sculpting, right? And then now I'm moving my sphere around where I want it. Okay, and then now I can come here and then just start continuing the stroke, right? And then I can go this way if I want to, and I can go this way if I want to. And you notice it's going to be really hard for you to even tell when I started and when I ended. Like, look at that. There's no way no one would know when I started and ended there, right? That's what this slider, Lazy Snap, is doing. It's remembering the last time the brush touched the surface, remembering that point of interest. So if I turn this way up, okay? You'll notice that now, if I'm not even anywhere near it and see where it started from, so let me do that again. So let me make a stroke from here to here, right? Moving the model around, and now I'm way out here in no man's land, right? Look, look where it started. Yeah, and the key thing here too is how Paul has this set up without the pressure sensitivity. So if you're doing it with pressure sensitivity, you may end up getting a difference where that start and the end is because the pressure is going to be different, you know, depending how if you drew that stroke and then released your pen slightly, it could be off. So make sure you use that. And then the morph target is the other key to this process. Yeah. You got to use the morph target. Like, look at this people. I can do this, do this, now turn it, then just go like, okay, now I want to continue going down the surface this way. Like scribe lines. What? They're easy. There you go. So I wanted to share that. That's one. If we have enough time, I'm going to show you guys another one tonight. If we got enough time. Okay, Dress, you got another one or we're moving on to the next video? Moving on, moving on. Okay, we got, moving on to the next video. We're trying not to keep everyone here forever tonight like we did yesterday. We're not doing that, <laughs> we're not doing that. All right, next video, people, here we go. Hey guys, I'm Nilo and welcome to another video of mine. So, you're excited about the new ZBrush tool of simulation and micromesh, right? bet you can't wait to start using it. But what if I tell you that? Only simulation is not enough. 
There's a lot of more things that you should think about when you want to create some cool clothes. Don't get me wrong, anatomy is important. I love it, I study it, and you should too. But when was the last time you made a naked guy for a professional job? I know there's a lot of main characters, badass, in games that play without a shirt. Or even superheroes wearing columns. But if you think coldly, most of the characters are fully dressed. And no one talks about it. And that's why I'm here to bring you this video with tips and tricks to improve your clothing models. And here goes your first tip. Study your model. Let's have a look at this model, for example. He's fully dressed. Accepted by his arms and face. So, how do you make a model wearing so many overlapping clothes in a way that he doesn't look the same from head to toe? It's simple. Study your model. It is very common nowadays to take a 2D concept and simply transform it into a sculpture. But think with me. If you spend some time before to start to know better your character, where he's going to, where he comes from, who he is, then you have a lot more information that can help you in important decisions, like what kind of fabric to use, for example. This is Orlov from the great Ivan Amutsen. And in my imagination, he's kind of Scottish warrior, very rich and very important too. This simple thinking helped me in important decisions, like he may have a very good made weapon, or he lives in a cold place, or even his clothes would not be so dirty, neither spoil it. Cool, now I have a north to follow in my compass. I'm ready to go to Pinterest and search some reference. Which takes us to the second tip. Try to not be obvious. If you look at the Orlaf scape, you may see it's thick and heavy fabric. Maybe wool. And you can show it by sculpting the folds down the yard because of the weight. Thus, thicky wool also influences the size and repetition of the folds. And it's way different of the other wool piece, which we'll be needing at the end, with an even trickier edge of braided. Both pieces are wool made, but they have different behaviors. The shirt is made of fine fabric and it is in contact with many other objects. So it makes sense that it is malleable and full of folds. His pants are also made of malleable fabric. And look at this, wrap it in tiny bands. As a medieval warrior, he has a lot of leather and here's a new chance to not be obvious. If you compare the leather of the cape, which is rusty because of the fur, it's way different of the chest leather, which is straighted, malleable and full of folds directed by the seams. Now. If you compare leather with other fabric, you see even more contrast between them. There are countless types of fabric, and each one has a specific shape of fold and trim. Just because you found out something that looks good in one piece, don't mean that you should repeat it in the whole model. Just try different fabric in the same model. Try different shapes in the same fabric. And this stuff don't need to be limited to clothes. You can try variations of seams, Carving, wooden, fur, whatever your imagination takes you. If you're able to make that, you'll be able to represent any material in your model only with the sculpture, without any fine detail or color texture. Third tip, tell a story. You're ready to start the most wanted step in modeling, right? You can't wait to add the detail in every single poly that you have. Details are important and you can tell a lot of your character with them. Let's have a quick view in Orla's face. He have a couple of scars, don't he? When you see it, you probably think that he had one fight or two in his life. So why don't bring this same tough for the cloth? When you add ripped or blood in a cape, for example, you're telling little stories for every single part of your model. And when you make that, your whole model gets richer. Let's try this in Orla's cape. When I'm happy enough with the result of the sculpture, I'm ready to add some woven. So the first thing you need at this point, it's a clean mesh. And it's better if it have only one side, an open-head UV. And yeah, here it goes. If you have only one side model and clean mesh, unwrap UV is more than enough to work with. I'll just press this button. The UV is for the surface noise. Go to surface and turn on noise button. What I'll do now is just add some alpha. 
to get an overview of how this works together with the rest of the model. Very simple and very fast. Adjust these parameters here, like strength or size. And voila, the cape is done. <laughs> I'm joking, we're very far from the end yet. Once I'm happy with this alpha, I just leave it here like it is. And here is another good tip for you. I don't apply alpha or micro mesh at this point. If you keep noise turning it on without applying, you have a very nice preview with a very light model. And you should keep like this as much as you can. Now, I will repeat this process in all the other fabrics that should receive woven. After that, I got a very nice preview of how the model will look at the end. I finally finished this step and I'm ready to subdivide my mesh like hell to add as much detail as I can. So at this point, what I do is another trick. I separate my subtool in a totally empty folder. I now can work in a much higher poly count in a lighter way. Now I will subdivide my mesh three or four times and turn it on again surface noise. OK. It's a good idea to add a layer, you can have more control. But at this moment, the cape is still a little boring. This is totally obvious detail, and don't tell me any story but manufacturer added blanket. If we have a look at our wool cover reference, we can see some noise that appears even in the new ones, so we need to add them. I will turn off layer and create a new one layer to add damage. This may be not so perfect. Wool and yarn. Or could be a simple imperfection in the time of making it. Now, a new layer for a very strong damage that could happen in a very simple walk in the battlefield. Nice, now we're having some fun. For the end, I will remove some very small pieces of woven. And if you work enough with these directors, you can have a result like this. And that's it, bros. Hope you have enjoyed yourselves, and até mais, galera. It's another good one. You got to wake everybody up after that <laughs> one, right? So that was another good one. So the, I think the, the main thing, you know, for everyone, yeah. you know, definitely, like, if you can get bringing story into a character, it adds so much. And even if just the clothes, like, the amount of detail that he was putting in to all those things. And did you see how many printers he had behind him, too? That was the other thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the music, I think, got some of the people, though. That's what I mean by waking them up. Wake it up, people! Let up here! Right? So, I was awesome. Yeah, it was a great trip. I think it was an even just simplistic way of working with cloth to get the end result that looks mm -hmm. amazing, right? Just, again, thinking a little different, thinking outside the box. It does make it simpler, right? Break things down simpler, and you're going to be able to go a lot further I'm, I'm, with what you're trying to get to. Very cool workflow. Marcel, it was awesome. It was just an awesome workflow. Okay? Just making sure everyone's awake okay i know it's early in the morning for some of you right yeah we're gonna get going though to the next video we gotta get we gotta stay on track here on the time there's no, no no deviations today there's keep no that ship sailing today. straight
Yeah, let's let's play this next video. Let's go for it. Next video. Hello, my name is Ara, and in this segment, we're going to be talking about a technique called scan bashing, which is like photo bashing, a technique that a lot of concept designers use to take different photographs and cut out parts of them and put them in a composition or a concept design. Uh, they do that because it's fast and also uh, it's an easy way to kind of um, grab a bunch of photos and then get parts of it that you want to create a new composition. So we're going to be doing the same kind of thing with 3D scans. So the term I'm coining right now is called scan bashing, which is basically taking scan parts and then using them in a model. So here I've got uh, a, a concept that I'm working on for a pilot uh, for one of the mechs uh, that I have. And uh, I made the sculpted the helmet from scratch and uh, used the dynamics capabilities of ZBrush 2021 to generate this scarf and then use micro mesh to add this kind of pattern to it. And then also I'm working on uh, this bullet belt that I'm going to be uh, making available on Gumroad uh, soon. So, uh, but I wanted to add a body to this and I didn't really want to spend the time to, uh, to sculpt one from scratch. So I basically uh, use this technique to get the uh, this uh, part here and I'll be showing you uh, the methodology that I uh, use to get these parts. So um, let's go ahead and uh, solo this out and let's go and see exactly how uh, or where this came from. So that jacket uh, that I had came from this model right here. So you can see that uh, I like this jacket. I thought it would work. I didn't like the hood. I removed it and I basically used the parts of it that I wanted to use. Right. Um, and uh, so here's kind of uh, that jacket uh, isolated out. And now I have this as a scan bash part that I can have in the library and use it in the future. So um, here, um, I'll go ahead and bring up this model right here and we'll use this as an example to isolate or extract out a part. So let's say that I really like the scarf and I wanna add that to the pilot as well. Uh, and instead of uh, sculpting a scarf from scratch, I can basically uh, use the one that's here. Uh, and to do that, uh, there are different ways of doing it. Of course, I can always kind of mask it and I isolate out the other parts or whatever, but there's also a much faster way and that's going to be what uh, this video is going to be about. So the good news is that uh, a lot of these models uh, that you get are done uh, with photogrammetry. So in addition to the model itself, uh, you do get a texture. So the te texture is very photographic, very real. So this guy pretty much looks uh, like he does in real life. It's like grabbing that character and putting him inside of ZBrush. So now um, I have this texture map, but I don't have the polygons themselves are not painted in those colors. Uh, the good news about this texture is that um, it does does have good contrast, right? So the scarf is a very a contrasted color from the sweater and his head. So I can go ahead and use that to my advantage. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take this texture information and I'm going to paint the polygons with it. And I can do that just with a one button press. So here, let me turn the um, polyframe on. I'm gonna turn the texture off for now. And here under poly paint, there is an option uh, to poly paint from texture. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So poly paint from texture will basically go ahead and paint my model uh, from that texture. So now if I turn polyframe off, you will see that the polygons have that, uh, that same uh, kind of colorization as that texture did. Now you can see that the um, it's not as detailed and that's fine because this is basically painting the polygons and the polygons are small in certain areas and big in other areas. So you're going to get a little bit of variation in color, but it's still going to keep that contrast, which is what I want. Uh, OK, so now what we're going to do, the next step is we're going to go ahead and group the polygons based on that poly paint. So what we're going to do here is I'm going to turn colorize off for a second and I'm going to go to the poly groups menu. And these uh, menus, by the way, are all in the tool uh, menu. So these are sub menus of the tool menu. Uh, and then here, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and group from poly paint. Now there's the P tolerance slider here and the default is 0.1, which means the less it's going to create lesser groups. Uh, I can maybe bump this up to 0.2 uh, and uh, let's see what result that gives us. So if I click on the from poly paint button, now I've got poly groups on here. Uh, and if I turn colorize off here, I'm just going to go ahead and turn off the color of, uh, I guess it is off. Okay, so now you can see that I've got different polygroups, different one for the sweater, the hair, etc. 
Uh, now the good news is that now that I've got these groups, I can isolate them. So if I hold Control Shift down and let's say click on the scarf, like so, it goes ahead and isolates the scarf. Now since my p-tolerance was pretty low, it created different uh, polygroups, um, uh, a lower number of polygroups. So now I've got one that has the scarf, the hair, and the pants, and the sneakers. So, uh, but in this case, I just want the scarf. So I don't really need the rest of that information. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete the polygons that have that rest of that information. So under the geometry um, menu, and under Modify Topology, I will go ahead and click on Delete Hidden, and that will delete all the hidden parts. And now the next thing I need to do is get rid of the pants, the, the tennis shoes, and uh, all these little polygons that somehow got grouped in with the scarf. So the only two things I can salvage from here are the hair. Uh, I can use that uh, in a composition if I want to, so I can separate that out, and the scarf. So to do that, what I will do is hold Control Shift and just select a little bit of the scarf, right? So now I've got uh, that scarf selected. And then if I click Control Shift and A, what that will do is it will select all of the uh, parts that are actually connected together. Uh, so I notice here that the hair and the scarf are connected together, so it selected those, but it did not select all the other kind of floating bits and the pants. Uh, so with a kind of a one button click, I was able to isolate those out. I just clicked on double to kind of see the inside parts. And now again, I don't need those inside, uh, those uh, parts that I hid. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and delete those. And now I'm just left with these two. And here, luckily, the separation between the hair and the scarf is pretty much a straight line. So I'm going to kind of line that up like this and just go ahead and uh, isolate out the hair. And then now I don't want to delete the hidden parts. Um, actually, I can. Uh, let me do that. Um, but I can also split them. Uh, let me do the splitting, actually. That might be an easier way to do it. Okay, so here's the hair, uh, right? And then I just go to Subtool over here. And in the Subtool menu, there is Split Hidden. So what that will do is it will create a new Subtool that's going to be the hidden parts, which is uh, what I wanted, which is the scarf. So now I've got the hair as one piece and I've got the scarf as another piece. So here's the scarf and um, what I want to do here is maybe get rid of some of these parts that are kind of floating. So one way to do it is again control shift but this time uh, once you select the part if you hold alt down your rectangle turns into uh, a red color and that means it's going to be subtracting those parts. And I can just go ahead and do that little by little and, and uh, I'm also going to show you another technique uh, to do that same thing. Alright, so uh, then once you're done, you basically will have this as a separate object. Now, the technique I'm going to show you, I actually am going to, uh, that I'm going to use next, I'm going to show you on another model uh, just to kind of uh, make it more um, understandable. And that is that, let's say I've got this model here, and again, I want to extract the jacket like I did before. So one thing I'll do first is just select the parts that I want to keep. So I'll just do kind of a, a blanket selection here of his um, of his jacket, uh, and then I'll still have part of his head and part of the pants, which I need to get rid of. So the first thing I'll do here is under geometry again, delete hidden parts, I don't need those. And now uh, I want to kind of close up out the holes that it has at the bottom and the top here. And to do that, I'm just gonna go ahead and dynamesh this. So I'll go ahead and dynamesh it, maybe a resolution of 1024 and uh, no blurring because I wanna keep as much of my uh, sculptural information that's in the scan as possible. And just click on dynamesh, oops. I think the 1024 didn't take. We'll do that one more time. 1024 Dynamesh, and then now I've got this, right? So um, now that I've got this, uh, I can go ahead and start removing the parts that I want. So here I'm using the smooth brush. So if I will shift down, uh, it's starting to smooth out those parts, and this is gonna take a very long time for me to do it this way. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and use Sculptress Pro Mode. So in Sculptress Pro Mode, I can go ahead and start removing this, and if I choose a bigger brush, I can start removing bigger chunks of it, right? So let me turn poly frame on so you can see what's going on. So here I'm removing bigger, bigger parts of it, but um, I can maybe um, do this even faster if I um, have a bigger brush. Now, if I have a bigger brush though, it's going to um, 
destroy a lot of the other parts that I don't want. So um, in order to kind of overcome this issue, uh, what I will do is in Sculptress Pro, Pro mode, in the brush menu, uh, in the Sculptress Pro sub menu of the brush menu, I can click off Use Global. Uh, that means that it's not going to depend on the brush size. And here I can set a brush size that I want or a kind of a subdivide size, uh, the triangle size that I want. So now I can choose whatever size brush I want and it will give me kind of this size triangle. So I can easily go in here and start removing these parts that I don't need like so. Right, so I'm just eating into that scan until I get to such a point where um, oops, I have uh, erased or removed the parts that I don't want. And Sculptress Pro mode is really nice for this. Um, here we go. So now I just basically have that neckline. Uh, I can also use this exact same technique with the um, clay tubes brush or the standard brush and just remove the parts that I don't want. So I've already done this uh, before so I'll just go ahead and show you the result and you get something like this where I've basically gotten rid of the pants down here and gotten rid of the um, uh, head and now I just have this jacket that I can use over and over again in all sorts of compositions Okay, so I'm going to use that same technique that I did uh, with the scarf So here I've got the scarf that uh, we just uh, Separated out right and there it is and what I want to do here is I want to start removing some of these frayed edges uh, on the on on the scarf that I don't need so to do that the first thing I'm going to do is go into the uh, new capability in ZBrush 2021 uh, which is uh, adding thickness in dynamic subdivision. So I'm going to turn dynamic on. Uh, there's two orphaned unused vertices here, it says. So I think a good way to fix this, let's go ahead and make sure that all my um, hidden parts are deleted first. So let's go ahead and go into geometry and modify topology and let's go ahead and delete hidden one more time and let's see if this solved the problem. Yep, it did. So now that I have dynamic subdivision on, right, um, it adds some smoothness to it, which I don't want, but I do want to add some thickness. So now I'm just going to go ahead and add a little bit of thickness to this. There it is. And now uh, I want to get this to be uh, geometry. So I'm going to go ahead and go into zero measure and I'm going to uh, zero mesh this, uh, but I want to keep this polygroups because uh, with the thickness, it adds a polygroup on the inside and a polygroup on the edging. So we'll keep the groups and we'll go ahead and zero mesh this and let's just use the defaults and we get a result like this. Now I can see some of the detail that I had on the scarf is gone, but the general shape is still there uh, and it did get rid of some of those kind of frayed edges automatically for me anyway, right? So now I basically have clean geometry to do that with. And if I want to further remove, uh, let's say, part of his neck that's here or whatever, I can use that same technique that I did before with the Sculptor's Pro Mode and just go in here and kind of erase away the edging that I don't want. So with just a little bit of work here, I can go ahead and have a scarf that I can use in future compositions and scan bash them into um, other models as needed. Okay, so hopefully this is, has been a useful technique for you to use. Uh, and uh, thank you for watching and happy ZBrushing. And another one. All right. Yeah, so the thing yeah. to remember too, like what Ara was shown there with scan data, just remember it's all 3D data. And you can always reuse 3D data. You can project 3D data. Like Paul was showing earlier with the uh, projection recall and the history recall. Like if you can get data in, you can use it. And that's one of the cool things about, you know, the technologies with photogrammetry and other stuff. Like there's a lot of ways you can start building stuff and getting ideas and reference images. And then even split screen, Paul, that might be a good one to, uh, Ooh. to bring up. Yeah. Ooh. Yes, that would be a good one. That's a good well, one. I say, I say what we do is we, we get through the videos here. And then if we have time, then we can go on tangents. What do you think? Yeah, I think that'd be good. But before we go to the next video, I have one question. I'm trying, I'm trying to catch up on some things on chat. Someone's asking um, about retaining subdivision levels. I don't know what you're referring to that, but if you can throw that in the chat again, uh, I think you were talking to Mr. Thomas Wittelbach about it. I want to see what you're doing because there might be things to do. Uh, and I'd like to see that. Maybe we can show it like Joseph said. So we're going to move on to the next video though, because then that way, 
we can look and see where we're at. Ara, thank you so much for that video. Yes, that was thank really you. Really good. It was an amazing video. But we're trying to stay on track tonight. We're trying to because we got, we got presenters. We can't dilly dally tonight. We can't yeah, just go got, off on our yeah. own for two yeah. hours. There's no inception <laughs> tangents tonight. We got presenters <laughs> after this, right? We got Will Huff after this, and we got Ellie after this for more toy stuff, right? All right. So let's move on to the next video. Hey guys, my name is Mike Thompson. I am an illustrator illustrator and a sculptor and I've been using ZBrush for five years. I started in 2015. Um, main reason I started using ZBrush was because I needed help uh, with reference and I found that being able to see figures that I was going to paint for box art for like G.I. Joe and Star Wars and things like that uh, in 3D and have the light kind of wrap around them really helped me with my paintings. Uh, my tip for today is kind of making seams for your figure, uh, for your superhero. And um, so I'll show you my technique. Uh, full disclosure, it's not going to be good as anything that Mike Pavlovich would do. All right. That being said, let's get into it. Um, as you can see on my screen here, it is uh, the Omega Red that I've been working on in my ZBrush Lives. And if I were to isolate him, you can see that I kind of started figuring out the, the panels on this guy on the seams. And if I turn off my, let's turn off that rim light and kind of center up our light here, go into the tool and I've isolated him. And uh, let's turn off the color. Choose a color that you can see. So you can see that uh, there's a good portion of it that's done already, right? Um, or anyway, I started it. So I will continue to, uh, to do that. So let's turn on the color. I've used poly paint to indicate where my, um, where my lines and everything should be. And if I go and I'm going to mask the area that I don't want to morph back to, uh, because I've put in this work here, let's just mask that. And now um, I've stored a morph target earlier. If I go to morph target and hit, um, see what switch does. Yeah, switch undoes everything. All right. So let's grab my morph brush and uh, let's go and see if I can get my. Uh, Holly paint back. Hmm. Switch. Did I already switch it? Uh, okay. All right. Well, let's do this then. Um, I'm going to draw these lines back and, uh, and then I can re, uh, I can show you what I did. So just going to grab my standard brush, set it for black and go. Redraw with my lazy mouse turned on. <clears throat> I will redraw the lines the way that we had them. For me, it's easier to uh, it's easier to go in and draw the thing. Uh, with color, and then if I make a mistake, just go paint over it. Then, if I was to sculpt the detail, and uh, and then try to fix it that way. All right. So that's kind of it for that side. Let's come over here. I think I just did a little bit of this like that. Actually. Okay. All right, so now I can go in and start to cut these lines, right? So what I'll do now is I'm going to switch to my uh, slash brush and I have both my subtract like normal and I also turned on RGB and I'm going to set this for white, right? Um, 
and let's go in now. And I have my lazy mouse turned on, set 30, and I turn down the intensity from 70 to 48. Uh, so what I can do is I can start to draw in scribes of where these lines are going to be. And okay, make sure you change the angle. And another thing that kind of helps is I'm getting shadows cast from the rest of this guy. So it would help if I just kind of isolate the area that I want to work on. This. Get your camera handy the way you want. Get your light so you can see what you need and maybe turn up the intensity so I can see. There you go, that helps. Just kind of start to scribe in these lines here. All right? So if I was to turn off my color, go back to the subtool and turn off my little paintbrush, also turn the light down because now it's way too bright. You can see that now I have some lines there. Um, I'm going to actually turn up the intensity on this. And let's undo these. Once I lock it in, then I uh, don't have to worry about doing it again. And again, because there is um, the form changes so much, it, it helps to change the angle again. All right, I'm going to get this one here, and then I'm not going to worry about this part right here because what I did, if you turn off the light here, or the color rather, you can see that that part kind of recesses into the mesh while everything raises up that's around it. So what I can do now is I can switch to my inflate brush. Okay, lazy mouse also set to 30, and I turn the intensity to 16. And what I'm going to do now is just kind of go over these edges to get them to buckle up next to each other. But up next to each other like this, and it looks bladed. It's like two pieces of material rather than, than one. So I'll go around this guy. That. What this also does is it, it kind of closes the gap between the uh, what I've drawn in with the with the uh, slash three brush. So it makes it feel like panels as opposed to as opposed to uh, just a piece that, that I've run this over here. All right, so now what I can do is I can switch to my damn standard and I want to go in and just detail around it. So as you can see, I already kind of did that on uh, the other side, so two. And what that's going to do is it's going to fake the uh, the stitching. Let's take this deeper. Uh, all right. So once I have something that I like, what I can do now is get up here too.
that. Right? And if I make any mistakes on here, it's okay because I can just switch to my morph brush. And I remember I stored a target earlier. I can kind of mask the area that I don't want to morph back to and just erase these areas back until I have what I want. So anywhere where there are any mistakes, it's really easy to clean them up. And then just do it again. All right. So once I get something that I like, let's do this panel in here that's inset also. Let me show you how I did that. Clean that up. All right, turn the color back on. And now what I can do is I can mask this area. I'm using my mask lasso tool. Okay. Turn off color and just make sure that it's clean because I want this to not look too wobbly here. All right, that looks all right. Okay, and I got the back too, so I'm going to do that. And now I will polygroup that. So if I turn on my polygroup, you can see that it's its own group. And uh, what I can do now is I can mask it just by kind of selecting it. And blur the mask a little bit. And go over to mask. So now what I can do is I can grab my move tool. And I can push this down a little bit. All the way around. Kind of tuck it under. Push it down. That's that area too. Push it down. This. Kind of pulling it under the mask to get a sharp edge. Do a little blur. Do it again. Do a little blur. Like that. And then maybe uh, invert the mask like that. And now what I can do is I can grab my inflate again and tap this edge with the inflate. This. All right. And then you can switch back to my damn standard and just kind of draw in this line here. I think that extends on the other side, it does. So let's turn on the color so I can see where it's supposed to go. It's right there. So now I can grab this, drag it around the side like that, and come over here and get this. And then now I can Get this line here, like this. All right, let's make the color off. It's looking pretty good. Then go in now and inflate these edges here. And here. With lazy mask, I don't have to worry about having like a wobbly line here. It's pretty pretty clean. All right. So now um, it's just going in and adding a little bit of wrinkles uh, where those edges meet. So I can go and grab a brush and start to just you know pull ooh, not that much, pull a few wrinkles. It really sells the idea that this is um, that this is fabric, right? So that is the technique. Um, I think that's my time. If I undo here and turn my color back on, you can see that. But now I can paint those areas out, and that is it. All right. Thanks a lot. Happy Z brushing, you guys.
Awesome. 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 All right. So I got one, one thing quick to add there, Paul, and then, then I'll give it to you. So that's all okay. Good. Go ahead. You're up first. <clears throat> Whoa, so this, so this one's just a quick one uh, from what Mike was showing. So one thing that I just want to show here. Uh, so he was using his like texture image as like a guide. So he painted it and then he was using that as guide is where like the fabric panels needed to go together. So as he was doing this, he was going and turning it on and off. Um, one thing we added up here in the render palette is you have the ability to fade opacity. And this is just gonna look at any of the poly paint that's basically applied to the model. And as you crank this, you're gonna be able to fade it down temporarily. So you don't have to really disable the texture on the model, but you can fade it down enough where you can see, you know, those details still there. And then you can come in and add those back up. And then if you wanna see the texture really quick, instead of turning it on and off, this will go through and do it across everything and you can just fade it back in and out. So a little handy option there, the fade opacity. And then and I, I use that quite a bit. So this, uh, the fishy, he was definitely uh, had those scales on there. And then I went back through and used that option to sculpt the uh, details in. Here, fishy, All right, Paul, fishy, back to you. Here, fishy, 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 fishy. All right. So let me show something. I want to share something that it actually goes a little bit of what he was saying. Number one, it's red wax. Okay, I know you guys were asking for it. There you go. You're welcome. So I want to now finish out the thing I talked about scribe lining for hard surface, but actually even some of this can be used with what he was doing as well. If you guys think, again, a little different. So I just got, I, I can't keep it on. I can't do it. I can't keep it on. I need a, this. It's just overbearing for me, when I, especially when I go to this mode, okay? So you guys can see this is just a simple shape. It's nothing crazy. It's not complex. It's just a shape. Right. And, but notice, notice that there's three poly groups. So I got one, two, three. Okay. That's very important. It's got three poly groups. Okay. So, okay. So now that you have this, okay, I want to make this an insert mesh brush actually. Okay. So I'm just going to look at it this direction. You guys are going to see why I'm looking at it this way. Okay. In a little, in a second here, I'm going to say, B -b 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 -b, and then I'm going to say create insert mesh brush. And then just, I'm gonna say new, okay? Don't forget, you guys could just go to the brush palette now and say from mesh. There's there's more than one way now to, in, in essence, make an insert mesh brush, right? So now that I've done this, I can draw this until my heart contents. Yay, it's so gorgeous, yay! That's not what I wanna do. What I wanna do is now I wanna apply this along a curve, okay? So I know just I'm gonna beat you to the punch. Magnifier! Right, so there's your curve mode. You know what, just because this is gonna be probably one of my last tips tonight, let's go. You better go all out, you better go all out. Go less zoom, no curvature. Let's let's get rid of the shadow. Oh yeah, let's make the frame darker. Look at all these controls you guys have. Especially those of you that are teachers, this is huge, man. I use this all the time. I'm a big, big fan of this, right? <laughs> what, what? I'm just, I'm just laughing because you went into the preferences for the magnify. That's it. I'm, that's, that's, I'm, that's right. I'm just, you're yeah. just giving me a little chuckle back here. You're waking me up. Waking I want, me up. That's what I want. I'm trying to keep you awake, mister. So <laughs> now I have this, right? And you can see what's happening here is we were repeating stuff. But notice the polygrouping. Notice I got a the yellow one and then that pink one and the blue one's repeating. So remember, take note of that. You got a blue being repeated but then there's the end and that's the beginning, right? So we have a beginning and end. This is gonna be very important because I want the beginning and the end to have a cap. In essence, I want it to be a complete watertight surface. Right now it's not watertight because right now we're just repeating. And the one thing I need to tell you is, hey, this is a mesh that I'm repeating along a curve, right? So what I wanna do now is tell ZBrush, let's weld all those points along the curve. So it's the mesh that I wanna weld and the mesh is the actual brush. This is why we call still our meshes tools. I'm using the mesh as my tool, not just that Paul's a tool, but the meshes are tools too. So you're gonna to go to brush, okay? And you're gonna open up modifiers. I've already got it open here. And you're gonna turn on this weld points just because Just loves it so much. Weld points right here. That's gonna tell it to weld the points. And then just like Joseph showed yesterday, I'm gonna add a little bit of resolution curve to this. So now when I touch, oh, like butter, like butter. Okay, so now you might be thinking, great, yay, where are you going with this? Guys, watch this. This is going to, this is the point where, this is Lisa Nice braces, Lisa Nice, look at me, look at me, right? 
yeah, I can never get enough of it, right? So I'm just going to take, again, something just really simple so it'll be visually good to you guys. And I'm going to bring in three people kind of use this tip already. Four, I think, if I remember, already this. The this frames? Time. You're talking about frame. Yeah, you're darn right I'm talking about frame. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do a little bit of this. I'm going to do a little bit of a slice, right? So I'm going to go to slice curve. And I'm going to say, let's make one here, make one here, make one here, and make one there. Right? So now I've got pop quiz for 5 million points, which means absolutely nothing. How many do I have, people? Go for it. Four, four, five, six. Seven. How many polygroups? I've got eight there, right? Because every time I slice, I'm making a new polygroup. So what's going to happen here is when I draw this out, you can see this is sitting on the surface. Right? See how it's just sitting there? Yes, this is the Wacom arm. I'm using the Wacom arm to hold up my Cintiq. You don't need to, but this is what I'm using right now, right? And what I want to do is I want to tell ZBrush, hey, this profile was on purpose by me. You guys see that profile? I want to use that profile on purpose, okay? So what I'm going to tell ZBrush to do now is let's go to my depth over here in the brush because, again, we are messing with the mesh's depth brush, right? So the mesh is the brush. So I'm going to go to the brush palette, and you can see my embed here is what is it 96 so what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna knock this just start knocking this down i'm gonna just put it at 50 for now right and then i'm gonna draw it out and then i'm gonna see and you see how it's sitting more into the surface now but that's not what i want i want it to be right around there so now i'm just gonna play a quick little guessing game what do you think dress 30 or do you feel 30 and then click oh 30. 30's get let's go 30. No, I think you need to go lower. I don't like, I want it a little bit lower. I'm going to go 20. Yeah, there, 20 is good. So you see now how some of that's sitting inside the surface, right? Everyone see that? Everyone's with me? Oh, everyone's following me down the ZBrush road. All right, so now, again, right? Don't make me say it. Everyone plug your ears. Look up here, right? So now I'm going to go to that old trick that everyone already showed you guys. I'm going to go to curve function and I'm going to say frame this puppy, right? So everywhere I have a different polygroup right now, curve, 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 right? And now all I'm going to do is just tap on a curve. And what do I get? Nothing but that curve going around everywhere, right? On my sphere. This is not the cool part, people. This is, okay, that's cool. But this isn't the part that makes me go, <laughs> oh, again, you guys know, I don't know why I laugh the way I do. All right, so down here now, I'll just tell it to split. I can either tell it to split by on mass points or mass points. At this point, it doesn't matter. It's just saying, what meshes do you want to separate based upon masking points, okay? So I'm just going to click either one of them. It doesn't really matter to me. And now I've got all the curves are their own subtool, right? And the sphere, its own subtool, okay? Now I'm gonna move this below so that the curves, right, are the other sub tool. Okay, I'm, wait, hold on. My icons, claw, you guys didn't even see that. So I've got the sphere and I've got the curves, right? Pretty simple. Right now, watch this. Live Boolean's on, turn on subtract, bam, bam. And the beauty part of It's like the Smash Brothers symbol. Uh, yeah. The beauty part is, remember Shane Olson's one, right? He was talking about non-destructive. This is a non-destructive workflow. These are curves. These are meshes, right? Look at that. That's gorgeous. That's perfect. That's exactly what I want. Looking deep, right? It's got a little bit of a little ridge right there. And then I made a profile like that. Like, come on. This is such a great way to get to this result, right? So you guys got to think. It's it's for days now. Now that I have this subtool, guys, I can just draw out and I'm I'm cutting into the surface. I can do this all day now, just boom, right? And cutting into the surface. It's whatever I wanted. Guys, this is, again, this is one of my favorite things with live bullions. I'm telling you, live bullions is one of the most important features I think we've ever added. The things you can do with it, if you just get crazy like Joseph and myself, it opens up your world so much. Drink the Kool-Aid. Drink that ZBrush Kool-Aid. Don't hold back, right? It's That's like the point dang. why we wanted to do this segment. What dress? Go. It's like a tang. It's like, it's... It's like space drink. Yes, right? So Speaking of drinks, who do we have coming up next? Oh, oh my goodness. You're excited about the next I, one. I am excited about this. Let me show the one quick thing that somebody actually asked the question about what also he was doing. 
So Joseph's little fish, right? He had a texturing. Guys, don't forget, you can paint inside a ZBrush and you can turn your paint into a mask in essence, right? So that's what we were doing yesterday's with nachos, right? If you guys remember the polygroup it, polygroup it, polygroup it, polygroup it, polygroup it. That's kind of what we were doing. So I'm gonna fill this with white and then you guys can, I'm just gonna switch to black and I paint, right? This is pure black paint, right? And so all I gotta do now is go into my masking menu, since you were asking, and I tell it to it mask by the color, the paint. So I'm gonna go mask by color and I'm gonna say mask by intensity. And look, there's even, the new, which no one's using Drust, it upsets me. It's another upsetter for me. It's another one that upsets me, right? So if you look, see, I just masked based upon the black paint, right? See that? There you go. However, we added a couple versions ago for you guys to mask by any paint. You can click this and you can pick any color you want, right? So if I use another color like red and then I use a blue, then Joseph, what color do you want me to use next? Uh, I can't tell. I can't see any of them. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> I think. I'm going to use hot, Joseph's colorblind for those that don't know. All right. So mask by paint. And now you guys can just click. And there, I just masked by the green there. And then I can add the red into it. Then I can add the blue into it. Then, you know, I got all these controls up here, right? I can hide the colors. Look at it. I can hide the mask. I can inverse the mask. So masking by paint, uh, yes, totally possible. And that's not the only place we put something like that. There you go. Ba -ba -ba! Right? That's all I have for you. That's the end of that segment. That's you, the you end. Have, you have a lot of people in the chat that's saying they use this a lot. Oh, good, because I've never there seen anybody use it. I've never mm -hmm. seen anybody mm -hmm. use it personally.